Good evening, Mr. Cabot. How are you? Have Good a seat. Evening. Mark, a pleasure. Thank you for that introduction. It was splendid. Uh, um, I'm reminded of a moment at an actors' equity meeting many years ago. You, you can sit. That's good. No, that no, yes, stand. standing. I'll stand. I'll be like Sullivan. I'll. And Blanche Yurka, Mark isn't old enough to remember her. Do you remember Blanche Yurka, the actress? She was the one sewing always in the movie Tale of Two Cities. And she got up in front of an equity meeting and they put a mic in front of her. She said, I am a trained woman of the theater and I do not need one of these infernal inventions. <laughs> not one word was heard for the next. Thank you, Blanche Yerke, for getting me on. I could do ventriloquism at that point when they couldn't hear you. But. Yeah, if, I, if my voice fails, it's nice to know that you can do me for the rest of the evening. Say, do you mind if I turn on this uh, tiny tape recorder? Um, if I say something good, I might be able to use it again. <laughs> good point. I do that. Oh, good. Well, I already had one running for me, but it was serious. Okay, well, so we'll, we'll compare tapes afterwards. Good, like like Nixon. Tell us a little bit about working for Jack Parr. He was the uh, he was the host of the Tonight Show for only four years, and it seems like a longer time. But he was the explosive host. You never knew what Jack yeah. Parr was going to do. I, I, I astonished Mark with that fact because the average person, you think, you know, Johnny had thirty years, and uh, you figure Jack must have had ten or so. Uh, it was really about more like four and four fifths years. Yet he did make an incredible mark. He was the most nervous, difficult neurotic, uh, thrilling man to work for and to watch on television, for my money, uh, who's ever done it. Uh, and I think the great Kenneth Tyne and the British critics said that when, uh, when you watch Jack and another guest, no matter who it is, even if it's Cary Grant, you can't take your eyes off Jack, because you might miss a live nervous breakdown on your home screen <laughs> if you look away for the merest moment. And I, I never saw so much uh, antacid uh, consumed by a staff as Jack's uh, staff, but uh, that, that electric dangerous quality of what in hell might he do next is, is, was thrilling. I, 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 it touched me when, I, when he said in an interview at the Broadcast Museum a couple of years ago, leaving the show was the biggest mistake I ever made. And I, he's a born performer, he's in great shape, he's 70 something now, and he's the life of every party he goes to. And he said that sometimes I'm bored because and somebody said, why don't you travel? You have all the money. He said, I've been everywhere. <laughs> and, and I think he has. Jack, um, I was one of six writers at the time. And Bob Hope, I think, was the first comic to make it clear that on radio that, that comedians had writers. Many people assumed they got up and said funny things about themselves. And Hope used to joke about his writers and blame bad jokes on them and so and the public, many of them, didn't know until then that there were writers. And the thing about it is, once they knew, they said, well, you know, I, I could be a comic, too. I could have been Bob Hope if I wanted. <laughs> because he has these writers, and they give him the jokes, and they don't seem to see that there's a lot more than that. And Jack was a brilliant ad-libber. And I have a favorite. I remember one time, does anyone here, perhaps at the bar or at the table, Remember Fat Jack Leonard, you know, Jackie Leonard, the insult comic? He appeared on Sullivan probably 125 times. He'd always look down at Ray Block, the band leader, and say, take your hands off your hips, Ray, there's been some talk around the union. Uh, <laughs> and I laughed every time. And he was on one night, and he would come on and spritz Jack with this relentless one-liners of his. Very funny man, very nice man, by the way. And he, uh, Jack one night said, I'm going to, I, I'm going to fox him. I, he, he, you know how, how he hits me with all the jokes, and, and they're oh, I laugh, but yeah. You know, so I, I'm going to, I'm going to not come back at him. I'm just going to sit, and don't tell him. But I'm gonna, just when he comes out, I'm just going to sit and I'm going to listen. So Fat Jack came out and he started. You know, Why don't you put your glasses on backwards and uh, walk into yourself? And he did about twenty. And it's with each one, Jack just either nodded or said, "Indeed." <laughs> and he began to, Jack, Fat Jack began to sweat. And he finally ran through his entire repertoire and he was just like a beached fish. <laughs> and he panicked. I never saw him do this. Veteran club comic. And he panicked. 
And he said the first fact that came to his mind, as you do when you're distracted or been hit on the head, and he said, you know, my wife's an acrobat. Jack said she'd have to be. <laughs> I reminded him of that years later. And he said, I don't remember, kid, but if you say I said that, I just said it. <laughs> Seemed pleased. You started... Am I dominating the conversation? <laughs> You're the guest. Oh, well, that's right. <laughs> Feel free to dominate. Okay. Oh, Speaking of that, I've got some rope uh, for bondage later. Oh, you devil. <laughs> you started out doing magic. The woman leaving now is my wife who said, if you do that damn rope trick one more time, I'm going to You started uh, out doing magic. I, I, I floored you on the first night on the ship because I saw you on the Don Allen Magic Ranch. Don Allen is a magician from Chicago, still alive, who had a syndicated magic show, 30 minutes, called Don Allen's Magic Ranch. And they used to have the youth magician. And when I was a little boy in Atlanta, Georgia, watching this, learning magic, the youth magician was Dick Cavett. I was from Nebraska. I came to visit my uncle and aunt in Evanston, and they invited me on this magic show. I was nervous, or I couldn't sleep for a month. It was from the Merchandise Mart, and it was live in Chicago. Not one person except my uncle saw it, apparently, except for Mark, who was... Now, I was uh, in high school, so we now know that Mark is a miracle of plastic surgery. Uh, he's 74. <laughs> it's Mark, isn't it? That's the Harry Lorraine memory course for you. Right? <laughs> would, would, you uh, would you grace us with the... You said you asked me, you said, I would love to do my rope routine. I, I have some well, magician's rope. Let, let me tell you scissors. what I, I, I do with the rope. Uh, I, I thank God you have some soft rope, as we call it in magic. It's not gimmick rope, by the way, and not, nor are the scissors. And uh, But the thing is, I, I always save it so that if I bomb, I know I have something at the end that's surefire. So if we, if we can hold the rope, and, and if at the end, when things are fading, and there are enough requests, I will show you a genius rope trick. Oh, no. Let's see the genius oh. rope trick. <laughs> oh genius. no. That's, that's kind of encouragement that keeps performers going. Uh, does it seem funny to you to be sitting in easy chairs? As performers, we're supposed to be standing up and sweating and, and acknowledging rim shots from the drummer and so forth. This is an audition tape for me, so I'm delighted to be sitting in these chair. <laughs> are, are, are we, by the way, are we being broadcast into people's suites right This now? is on CNBC right oh, now. Okay. <laughs> Say hello to Larry King. Absolutely. Well, he's on CNN. Then. He, I'm not. Anyway. You're right. My God, look, I've got boat lag. <laughs> How did I do that? It's not possible. When you were on ABC on your talk show in the evenings, uh, right up against Carson. I never thought of it that way, or I couldn't have gone on. Well, you dominated sometimes. I remember. I know he didn't think of it that way either. Is I remember a great show with the governor of Georgia, Lester Maddox. Oh my! God. And and Lester Maddox. You are an antique. I didn't vote for him, but I I just remember him. Lester. And tell him who else were the guests that night and yeah. what happened. Oh, Mark is. Um, has taken, in fact, the Harry Lorraine memory course, and, and his memory will... <laughs> he will be available afterwards he's, for... He's selling his... Uh, and uh, he... Uh, it's remarkable. He remembers the show, and he remembered who was on. Yeah, uh, that was in about 1972, and booking Maddox at that time uh, was as hot a booking as, as getting John Lennon was that same year. Uh, Lester's 15 minutes of fame had long passed, but you recall the famous photo of him in the Pick Rick restaurant brandishing a six-shooter um, to keep people of color out. And he used to like to flummox the press by saying, that picture me, they say, uh, they, uh, the press said they have a picture of me, well, waving an axe handle. I never waved an axe handle anybody in my life. Never in my life waved an axe handle anybody. And here was this picture. But of course he was right, because Southerners knew it was a pick handle. Uh, thus politicians flummox us sometimes. But we, he came on the show, Lester Maddox, James Brown, that is Jim Brown, the, the football player, and Truman Capote. Do you think we were asking for trouble? <laughs> <laughs> when Maddox sat down next to Jim Brown, he opened 
beautifully by saying, I thought you was a singer. <laughs> and Brown looked at him like, somebody said that as a duchess looked at a bent pug. And it looked like he would crush him like a paper cup. And Truman Capote was his, his usual self. I, he stunned me my first week in television. Uh, on my half, on my daytime, uh, my very first daytime show on ABC, and I had Capote on, and he was at the peak of his fame, and in Cold Blood was on the bestseller list. And, uh, I sort of ran out of stuff near the end, and I said, um, Hemingway's reputation seems to have slipped a lot in recent years. He's sort of laughed at now in snotty academic circles and so on. But <laughs> would you give us a little disquisition on, on Mr. Hemingway's writing? And he said, oh, oh that old closet queen. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, no one had ever said that to me. You know. <laughs> About Mr. Hemingway and Capote. <laughs> yeah. We had a letter from Mary Hemingway before the show was up, uh, keeping the flame out there in Ketchum. Uh, why was I, in fact? Oh, yes, thank you, Mark. Lester Max. Yeah, thank you, Harry Lorraine. And uh, so the show got going, and, and, and it got pretty contentious. In fact, I watched a tape of recently, and I was on the edge of my chair. It just tension beyond belief. And we got back and forth. And then there was the apology incident, you may recall. Uh, he, oh, I forgot, in the, in the movie broadcast news, we, the public learned that on television you must sit on the tail of your jacket, otherwise it bunches up in the back. Uh, don't everybody do it. Uh, and, and, and it was getting kind of rough, and um, at one point uh, I said, of the bigots who voted for you, uh, would you say that such and such? And I didn't say what he thought I did, but he was canny enough to say, Now, wait a minute, before you get that, I, you called all the people of Georgia bigots, and I, you're going to apologize to people of Georgia because you said the people of Georgia are bigots. And I said, No, wait a minute, Governor, I, that isn't what I said. I, I said, Of the, you, now you said all the people who voted for bigots, and, and you got one minute to apologize, and he rips out his uh, Timex, and he's watching the minute right I said, I'm going to walk off the show if you. Now, um, he was famous for that. He'd walked off Joe Pine. He, he had walked off Joe Pine, yes. And some people walked on Joe Pine, which was a good idea. But he, uh, we went to commercial, and we came back, and he was still hot at it. He'd allowed me to get through the commercial. Then he started his minute over. And we got about 32 seconds into it. And I said, all right. <laughs> If I've called anyone a bigot who isn't a bigot, I apologize. And, and haul that and walk right off to the uh, stage. But being a politician, he was canny enough to, uh, knowing the value of $66,000 a minute or whatever television time, uh, canny enough to walk off a scant 88 minutes into a 90 minute show. So there was only time for me to say, I'm sorry the governor left. And for a woman in the audience to yell, don't back down. I'm not backing down. I'll tell you when I'm backing down. And my, my lovely side came out. And then Truman grabbed the ball and said, you know, I ate in his restaurant. <laughs> it was, um, well, it wasn't finger licking good. <laughs> uh, I got about 6,000 letters, pro and con, many of them suggesting I, uh, Try swimming in the Yazoo River with an anchor around my neck <laughs> and waiting for Emmett Till. And uh, the governor got about that's a bit more than he'd ever gotten in his life. Uh, and he wasn't governor at the time. He was lieutenant governor in 72. He had, was governor from 66 to 70. He was Jimmy Carter's lieutenant governor. But you are an idiot savant. How do you do that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. So definitely Wapner. Yeah, yeah, Wapner at 3 o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about I'm so impressed with this guy. Your top two interesting guests that you have interviewed. Well, oh, that's very delicate because some word will get back to them from okay, from top three walls that I left somebody out. Yeah, that is hard because there's so many different categories, and uh, you know it's hard to compare with Groucho with say a show on alcoholism or or Vietnam veterans with a show of with. Um, Maddox or the Mailer Vidal show with Catherine Hepburn or Brando or Stair, and I'm not name dropping, am I? <laughs> um, I have one rule. I never never allow name dropping around me. 
I got that rule from Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> My Elizabeth Taylor impression. Lovely. <laughs> now, don't you. <laughs> Next. <laughs> hey. Whoa. So I did that. Ro I did the rope trick I'm going to do with Elizabeth Taylor once. I told you about it. Right. Yeah. right. And we had trouble. Uh, as luck would have it, I borrowed scissors from the band, or, or from the crew or something, and, and they wouldn't work very well. And it involved several cuts and restorations. And she was struggling with the scissors, and she said, I don't think I ought to cut the rope again. And I said, just think of it as the marital bond. <laughs> Why do we do these things? But she still speaks to me. <laughs> Were there any big bloopers on the show that, uh, I mean, as long as you've been on television and continue to be on television, ABC, CNBC, where something happened that maybe just shouldn't, but uh, it was still entertaining? Surprisingly few... Uh, well, a, a, a raptor of some sort, an eagle, got away in the studio one time. Uh, and, and it made me feel in a great tradition because there was a famous Fred Allen radio show in which a man brought an eagle on named, I think, Mr. Herbert. And the eagle got loose in the studio and then became panicked and did what birds often do in, in panic. And the great Fred Allen, who was my hero as a kid, writing about this, said, What appeared on Mr. Sarnoff's carpet it looked like a ghost's beret. <laughs> <laughs> who else would think of those perfect two words? In a letter to Groucho once, he, uh, he said about <laughs> Burl, uh, Milton is the moron's messiah. <laughs> Earl pretends to be amused by that when you remind him of it. Right oh, you did make me think of something where, um, yeah, uh, twice guests came on with their flies open. <laughs> Male guests, of course. Of course. Well, okay. And I remember there was a famous incident, that made me feel like a tradition too, because the nattiest of actors, the late Adolf Manju, had come on Jack Parr's show. Uh, he was always one of the ten best dressed men, and he came on with a gaping fly. And uh, Jack was able to make great comic capital of this, but uh, in my case, it happened with. God, I forget who the second one was, but the the main one was uh, Benny Goodman. <laughs> he was already out there. The trio was set over here in the performing area, and uh, I introduced him. They threw it to there. They they played a the number, and I could see that his fly was open, but he wasn't aware of it, obviously. My band of great musicians that Rosengarten put together, many of them had worked for Goodman and uh, didn't like him. The one followed from the other, apparently. <laughs> so uh, then he came and sat down by me. It still wasn't noticeable. And I knew that when he uncrossed his legs, there would be what in 19th century literature would be called a flash of white linen. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I did this. You, you'll have to do this with me. I'll, I'll treat you as Benny. Uh, the audience, of course, is all out there. I said, um, Benny, would you do something kind of strange just for fun? He said, well, sure. Yeah. I said, well, okay, would you do from this moment on everything I do? Okay, now. One of us has his fly open. <laughs> <laughs> we both, we both did that. I, he didn't really recover from that for what we could do. I was emceeing a show at a shopping mall in Atlanta, Georgia, people from Atlanta, your perimeter mall. Yeah. When I was in college, I was doing magic and ventriloquism, paying my college tuition, and I went on stage about to do ventriloquism with my fly open and my first line is, i like to show you my little friend now, and I, I, haven't, <laughs> bit. I haven't been invited back to the Mall, I, but I'm on the oh. Seaborn Pride, so I win. Well, you're in a great tradition there, too, because the great Sir John Gilgan split his tights in a matinee of um, Hamlet, which... Uh, at the National Theatre in London, and it was notorious, and of course he had great discipline, and nobody dared laugh. And he managed to finish the scene upstage somewhat over his shoulder. 
<laughs> and nobody laughed throughout the entire performance. There were mus muffled explosions from those off stage who didn't dare laugh. Then they did the play again that night. And when Horatio, I think it is, said, has this thing appeared again tonight? <laughs> <laughs> do, you so you think, think, do you think that comedians, like, and I consider myself a comedian who, who uses ventriloquism as his vehicle, I've read about Carson and I've read about yourself. I feel like I'm basically a shy person, but I'm more at home on stage entertaining people. Are, would you put yourself in that category? Yeah, yes, and I, I know exactly what you mean. I don't know how many people saw a show that I reviewed for the New York Times a couple weeks ago because it was the, uh, the Letterman Lano thing, um, Late Shift, from the excellent book by the same right. name. You right. wouldn't think a guy could get a thrilling 300 page book out of who's going to do the Tonight Show, but he did. And I thought they did the movie quite well, generally. And um, the saddest line, I think, was Dave Letterman saying, when somebody said, you're not going to get the Tonight Show, and you're going to... Uh, and he said, you know, I'm only happy when I'm doing the show. It's the only time. And I thought about that with Johnny and with Jack, and with most performers, you might agree, I think uh, there's something that makes them reluctant to leave the stage. It also happens in a play. And people who I know by the dozens whose lives are a mess, and they're on stage, and there they know how to control that world. They are totally at home. Nothing is Alec Guinness shyest of men in a documentary somebody talked to him doing on the BBC went up on a new stage that, 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 where they shot some of the documentary and he got on and they said do, do you like it up here and he said yes I'm at home now I know where everything is and in the last slide he did a couple of dance steps that he'd done in a play and walked off alone and I've seen I think it's nightclub performers or poor tragic Judy Garland who often did several encores more than, well, their audience always wanted them. And she said once, I stay on because when I go off into the dark and into the wings, I'm back in life. And the gin bottle on the hotel room table. Oh. I'm just in my cabin crying a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but haven't you seen that where somebody who's just shaky and they think this guy can't he can't speak to people and is nervous and fumbles the drug and they walk on stage with this fabulous command like a kabuki lion and you have that when you're out there i sat in for johnny a couple nights some years back and i petrified that later somehow i was always comfortable with johnny but he wasn't there and i went uh, at the minute i came through the curtain i thought i know this is what i do this is fine but the minutes behind that curtain were teeth chattering time. What is it? Some of us are born to the spotlight. I agree. Could you turn it up a little? <laughs> <laughs> when you mentioned that, that. You don't want to leave tonight, you know, you're in for three hours. <laughs> the HBO movie, The Late Shift. That, I had written that question down. As an, as an observer about that, I read the uh, book, hadn't seen the, the movie. But Letterman called Carson, and Carson told him if he had been treated that way, he would have walked. Yes. Do you think NBC made the best choice going with Leno, and uh, who do you think will prevail, if, if any? Yeah, that's hard to say now. It's hard diplomatically, because I know both guys, but uh, I, I wouldn't have gone with Leno at that time. And yet, ironically, even though the latest edition of the book is updated, and on the TV show, they showed Dave's theater and then ran a super that certainly didn't please him at the bottom of the screen saying since such and such time that this ends um, Leno's ratings have surpassed his and stayed that way. Uh, so I guess in their numbskull way of making decisions at networks it, it, it's, uh, it's kind of sad in a way that they're borne out at least at the moment. Um, so I, it, it's really Hard to say. Each guy obviously has a following, and I've always thought anything you put on television, somebody likes it. 
<laughs> and if occasionally they have the wit or, or out of mostly ineptitude and not having anything else.